Good morning, everyone. This is a topic that I love because I've lived it. And so, excuse me, my family will tell you that when I get passionate about something, I get loud. Okay, so if I'm starting to get loud, just be aware that it's just, yeah, me just getting passionate about what God does in people's lives. So I have the privilege of being part of the Set Free series, and I'm speaking on identity this morning. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time to minister, Lord. I thank you for this time to, to declare your mighty work that you're able and willing to do in the lives of each of your children. I thank you, Father, Lord, that you desire for each and every one of us to be set free in Jesus from anything, Lord, that hinders us from truly knowing what you have called us and purposed us to. And I thank you, Father, for your incredible, incredible love because it is in your love, Lord, that we truly know the freedom. Jesus said that he came to show us the Father. Lord, we, we recite John 3, 16 so often, for God so loved the world. Lord, we need to know today that it is because of your love that we can be free. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, so last week, Pastor Temba started by asking this question. Do you want to be healed? And you know, when he asked that question, it took me to the Bible passage where the man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5. And I've looked at that piece often, meditated on it and reflected. And, and you know, I looked at that guy. Jesus comes to him and he says to him, do you want to be healed? And the guy doesn't say Yes. He starts to complain how he doesn't have an opportunity to get to the pool when the angel comes to stir. Let's contrast him with blind Bartimaeus in Mark 10, 46 to 52. Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is coming past he can't see him. And he says to him, he starts to shout, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people tell him to shut up. But he shouts louder. What's the difference between these two people? The one could see Jesus. But he did not know what Jesus could do for him. And so all he did was complain. And you know, the grace of God, if any of you doubt that God loves you, if you think that you've done something so terrible God can't possibly love you or forgive you, Jesus heals this dude. Not only does, so this guy is now healed and immediately goes and reports Jesus to the Pharisees. Jesus doesn't undo the healing. Bartimaeus, on the contrary, praises God and follows Jesus. So today I'm talking about identity. And it starts with, do you want to be healed? Because if you do, the Son can set you free and you will be free indeed. But today you need to choose. So, I'm going to start with some. I have a British passport. I have a South African passport. I have a South African ID. If any one of these documents, now I, you know, we go into the world, these are the documents they will ask me to be able to identify that it's me. Okay? The truth is, is not one of these documents can ever tell you the truth of who I am. It cannot tell you what I've been through in life, nor can it tell you my testimony. It can just tell you that my name is. Before I start, you can see I'm getting warmed up. 
Pastor Temba asked me to clarify this one. Christianity and psychology. And he wanted me to make it clear what every nation sunning hill stance is on this. We're not adverse to people receiving professional help. Quite the contrary. But we do believe that we as a church can offer you something that those professionals with all their learning cannot. And that is the truth in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 18 tells us that we do not battle with flesh and blood. Now I believe that psychology and all of those things. And please understand, I myself am studying to be a narrative therapist, which is a form of psychotherapy. But as I study it, I know the limitations. I can see it, can do great work with it, but it is limited, it can only go so far. And the reason being is that we are not fighting flesh and blood. So you go to a doctor and they list the stuff and they say, oh, because of all these symptoms, you are diagnosed with. And we allow those diagnoses to determine who we are. That's the limitation of psychology and where Christianity can break through in areas that we can't in the professional. You see, what happens, we often have physical manifestations that have spiritual roots. Let me give you an example. So if somebody is battling with bitterness or unforgiveness, or even hatred, they are, going to be, they, they are going to have certain things start to manifest in the physical. Some people battle with um, arthritis, if they battle with bitterness. And I'm not saying all people that have arthritis are bitter. Please understand that. But it is, it is common. People that battle with um, autoimmune diseases. Often those things are because of traumas never dealt with in the past. Now it's interesting that this, the research shows that autoimmune diseases afflict women more. And it's interesting that most of them were because they were sexually abused as children. And they suppressed everything, never told a soul, but the body records and so it has physical manifestations. Can we break free from those things? Absolutely. But only in Jesus. Only in Jesus. Right. So I've now shown you my ID books and my passports and whatever. What is identity? What is identity? Isaiah 49 says this. Isaiah 49 verses 14 to 16 if you want to follow. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. The world tells us that God has forgotten us. Or that God is, you know, he's, he's not important. But God says, you're so important to me that I've inscribed your name upon the palm of my hand. We were talking about Easter coming up. And it is so relevant because you know what? The day that 
Jesus was nailed to the cross. Your name was there. If you doubt that God loves you, just look at the cross. You see, our identity is tied in the cross of Jesus Christ. And the love of the Father that sent him to die for you and I. Because without Jesus, we are no one. Jesus says to us in John 15, he says, Without me, you can do nothing. We're going to come back to this. But I love in this scripture that Jesus uses the love of a mother. Now, I don't, you know, I've got four children, and my children will tell you, mess with them, and you'll see something aside of me that you don't know, okay? Touch my children, and you'll see something come out of me that, yeah, anyway. <laughs> and yet, we know, we live in a fallen world where mothers forget where mothers neglect, mothers abandon, and that love is gone. But God says, even if, even if, I will never. I will never. Isn't that amazing? That is just such a reassurance that we are front and center in the mind of God. And it's not just certain people, every single one of his children. Psalm 139 tells us that the thoughts he has for us are, are so many that we can't count them. They're more than the, the sand on the seashore. Now, I, I don't know about any of you, but I've, I have held a handful of sand in my hand. And I've looked at it run through my fingers and realize that I cannot even count the grains of sand in my hand. And God says, I think about you so much, check the beach. That's amazing. That is just so beautiful. So, before I get into identity, I'm going to tell you what it's not. Identity is not what others say about you, nor the diagnoses that you have received over your life. I counsel people that come to me and say, you know, my folks said I was a mistake. I was not planned. They never wanted me. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, that, that, that's painful. You know, when I, I see them, I can see the pain in their eyes. I can see that it, it cuts to the core when a parent tells a child, I never wanted you. But you know what? I'm here to tell you today that from the foundation of the world, God was planning for you to be born. And if you doubt that, just listen to the stories of your predecessors. I was sharing with Faith one day, and it was such an aha moment for me because it was God showing me. I was telling her about how my parents had had death experiences or things where they should have died. And, you know, I was only telling her about two, but I could remember so many more that my mom and dad had told us. My mom grew up in Amanus, and she got caught in a whirlpool in the sea. She was told by the people that if you ever get caught in a whirlpool, that's it, you're gone. She can recall as she got caught in that whirlpool and being dragged down, she can even remember be feeling the bottom, crying out just this, God, please help me. She blacked out. When she came to, she was on the beach. Nobody could tell her how she got there. My father was four years old, crossing a street, as children do without looking. And he, there's this car. He says he was in the middle of the road, 
and he could remember just suddenly being lifted up and put on the side of the road. There was nobody next to him. The driver of the car thought he had hit my father. He stopped the car, got out, and he's all shaky, and he's like, oh, you're right, and my dad's like, yeah, I'm fine. You see, God had me in his heart. And so he preserved their lives, that I could be born. Even if my parents had not planned me, even if my parents had not desired me, God preserved their lives for me to be born. And not just for me. He had the hearts and lives of my children in his heart. You see, God's not, he's not for the here and now. He's got an eternal picture of which you play a part. It is not the position you hold, your work or qualifications, or even your ambitions or dreams. I remember one day I was standing in a room full of professionals. They were very highly, highly educated. And I looked at this and I felt inferior. And I said to God, I've got nothing to offer these people. And God said to me, take away their qualifications and what do you have? You have broken people needing me. You see, God equals the ground because he's not impressed by our qualifications. He wants us to see each other as worthy of Jesus. It is not the lifestyle you live or the amount of money you have. Because the Bible tells us that that can flee away in a moment. It can fly away, in fact, is what the Bible says. It's not your past sins or the shame and guilt related to them. It's not the abortion you had that defines you. It is not the sexual abuse that you had that defines you. It is not the lies and the gossip that you have done in destroying other people that defines you. It is not who your culture says you are. Now, you see, I'm, my father was of Irish descent. And the Irish are very passionate people. They are also known to have a very violent tempers. So I battled with a lot of anger because of things that had happened, and I'll share a little bit of that later, but I had a temper. You didn't mess with me in my 20s. Okay? I also exercised to get rid of the anger because I realized that if I didn't, I would be hurting a lot of people physically. And I used my Irish heritage to excuse my behavior. Ah, the Irish, yeah, we have tempers. Let's, let's rest with that. Until God challenged me and said to me, Grace, who are you aligning yourself to? Is the Holy Spirit within you not the one who gives you self-control? The same one that you say, Lord, you know, I've got no, self, I've got no self-control. He said to me, are you saying to me that the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in you? Those are the questions we need to have. God asks us for us to come out of the darkness into the light. It is not your family and friends. It's not your family name. It isn't what defines you. I, my mother's family, thank, praise the Lord, my mother wasn't anything like them, but it was, <sighs> they were the founding members, they were founding family of Amanus. And I tell you what, they made everyone know that. You can go into the graveyard there and you'll see lots of Warringtons. But you know what they did? Where's that name taking them now? Yeah. 
All of these things that I have listed here are external from you. They are not in you. Because you see, in blink of an eye, it can change. It can change. You can have an accident and, I pray you don't, but you can have an accident and in a blink of an eye, your qualifications, your ability to work is gone. Who are you then? You see, if we don't know who we are now, when all of these things, these things are taken from us, who are we? If you want to know what you believe about yourself, listen to the I am statements you make about yourself. I am depressed. I am tired. I am anxious. I am a mistake. You see, we we take on a lot of things. And yet Jesus himself... When he talks about himself, he says, I am. And you know, if you look at all of Jesus's I am statements, and I wrote down a few here, I am the bread of life. I am the gate. I am the living water. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, every, pos- every statement Jesus made about himself Every I am statement was positive. I am not advocating positive thinking here. I am advocating that we become aligned to the word of God and what he says about us. You see, because in the word of God, I am forgiven. In the word of God, I am blameless. I am holy. I am pure. In the word of God, I am redeemed by the blood of Christ. I am saved. You see, when we can say those statements about ourselves and actually believe it, we are free. We are free. I have some testimonies. I have, yeah, with permission. (laughs) A lady in this church, and I'm not giving her name for, for, for reasons, for confidentiality reasons, but she was battling with identity. We'd met her through grief share. Her parents had died when she was a very young child. And the family that raised her did not call her by name. They called her orphan. Okay. I don't know about you, but she was broken at that. And I remember our first session, and she's sharing this with me, and I can see that she is broken. Because for years, this has been spoken over her. To be honest, I can't tell you everything that transpired that day when we were, ch- we were talking. But I do recall saying to her, but you're not an orphan. And I literally just took her back to the scriptures that says that we are adopted by God. We are children of God. She has a father. And praise God, the Holy Spirit did his ministry work in that moment. Because from that moment, she, she saw the importance of claiming the identity as a child of God. Our subsequent, que- our subsequent sessions after that was really just about encouraging her to walk in that identity towards the people who had persecuted her. It was teaching her to love them when they are unlovable. You see, the truth sets us free. It is in her doing that, she shared with me recently, that her grandmother recently gave her life to Christ. Yes, give God a hand. 
Because of her willingness to take on the identity she has in Jesus and go and love them from that identity, it challenged the family that they could not call her orphan. And even if they did, it no longer affected her because she, said, she could turn around and say to them, I am not an orphan. I am a child of God and I have a father. The next testimony that I want to share, I've done a few times, so it's not a specific testimony, but it's something that I do often when people come to me and they are wrestling with issues about identity. And I start with this simple question. I ask them this one, and I believe it's of the Lord. I ask them, of the Trinity, which do you relate to most? Who do you relate to most of the Trinity? Who do you relate to most? Inevitably, that most of them will say Jesus or the Holy Spirit because they have an issue with God the Father. Why? Because God the Father has a mask on him. And that mask has been put on his face because of earthly fathers who have not loved their children and have not blessed them. When we start to work with that, I really just start to show them how Jesus came. And Jesus says this, all throughout the Gospels, he keeps on saying this. I, have, I only do the will of my Father. What my Father tells me to do, I do. You see, Jesus came to show us the Father heart of God because he wanted us to understand that we are reconciled in him through Jesus. And when we are reconciled to God the Father, that's when we know who we are. You see, because the love of the Father heals the wounds. I share these testimonies here, not to say to you that I think I'm a better counselor, but to share with you what God can do. You see, I am so thankful that I don't counsel people on my own. I have the counselor who ministers in ways I can't. I've sat in sessions where I've hit a brick wall with all my learning. And I don't know where to go. And I'm, I am so thankful I can call to him and say, Holy Spirit, help me. I don't know what to do here. And he inevitably shows me, you know, and the amazing thing is, I look at it and I'm like, that's so simple. Why didn't I think of that? God doesn't complicate things with lots of intellectual stuff. He just gets to the heart of it. Very simply just says, ask them this or say this. And then in that moment, it just, because he's already done the preparation, it just goes straight to the heart. And I have very little work to do thereafter. I just sit back and watch him do it. I'm in a privileged position as a counselor to watch God dance with his children and to see how when he's doing it, it's amazing. I want to share a personal testimony and why identity is such a, such a big thing for me. My personal testimony is as a child, I was around five and I was sexually abused by sons of friends of ours. And that became the norm of my life. But it also became how I identified myself. I became a victim. And I allowed my victim status 
to determine how I engaged with anyone. But it also made that I became, that I was re-victimized and re-victimized and re-victimized because that's normal. When you are a victim of your circumstances, you will be victimized again. Until one day, I was walking to school, I was a mama tricure, and I saw on this wall, there was graffiti. And it just had these three words, victim or victor. And I remember, words mean a lot to me, if none of you have picked that up, but words mean a lot to me. And I remember thinking about that the whole day. That hit home. And I realized that I needed to choose. Now, I didn't choose that day. And that's often the sad reality of many victims. They don't choose that day to say, I'm no longer a victim of my circumstances. I can rise above this and become a victor. And again, I'm not advocating positive, positivism or things like that. I am saying here, we can be victorious because in Christ we are overcomers. In fact, Romans tells us we are more than overcomers. We are more than conquerors. But I got to a place where I did choose. And I said, no more. And I broke the silence. You see, while you're a victim, you remain in that silence. You remain in that dark space of saying, I can't ever tell anybody because you live in shame, you live in fear, you live in guilt. You live in the fear of how people will see you. You live in the shame that if they know possibly what you've done, they won't like you. But we have a father that knows all of those things and still chooses to love us. You know, what's amazing for me is that Romans tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in Romans 2 verse 4, it says, it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance, leads us to repentance or should lead us to repentance. I don't know what your view of God is. But I trust and pray that you realize that it is only in his love for you that you will truly be free. Truly free. So identity in Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 10 tells us that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God did prepare beforehand for us to do. Before you were even born, Jeremiah tells us this, Jeremiah 1. Before you were in your mother's womb. So in other words, Jesus, you know, God's been thinking about Jeremiah before he's even conceived. He says, before you were even in your mother's womb, I set you apart. I set you apart to be a prophet to my people. You see, every single one of us have a purpose in God's plan. Every single one of us. We need to align to that. We need to align to what God has called us to. Because in aligning with him, we truly are fulfilled. It wasn't me choosing to be victorious in Christ that God birthed a ministry where I work with people, with women, that have gone through sexual abuse. It is in giving God the pain of my five miscarriages and saying, God, you know what? Just take this. Take the ashes of my life. That God birthed a post-abortive ministry where I can understand wishing you can undo things. 
go back and change things and you can't. I don't know your story, but God does. Every single one of us here are needed in the body of Christ. You hear us often saying, do live connected, find out where you, where you slot in. Why? Jude says this often in his sermons. He says, serve. It's in serving others that you become less focused on you. And there's something in that. You see, there's something in being humble. There is something in being obedient to Christ. And there is something in serving others that sets you free. Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4. I love this. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I have plenty, but this is one of them. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he sent me, sorry, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the Lord's and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. You see, that's God's heart for us. He wants to plant us as oaks of righteousness. Now, to any of you who have come to our house, we have a huge oak tree by our main gate. And it, it stands as a good reminder for me that God, when he plants us, he plants us solidly. And we become known as oaks of righteousness. You know, when you look at an oak tree, it is huge. And it is solid. It's one of the most solid woods People that work with wood love working with oak. Now imagine that. God wants to take the ashes of your life, the things where you have messed up, where you have placed everything on the altar of pursuing your own lusts, your own desires your own ambitions, and they've burnt up. The world says to us, well, that's it. Look at you, and they mock and scorn, and they give you names. But God says, give me your ashes. Watch what I do with them. I remember when God did this with me. He said to me, Grace, give me your ashes. But before he did that, he took me to Luke 9.62, which says that no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back, back is fit for the kingdom of God. What he was saying to me was, Grace, while you are looking at your past sins and while you are focusing on your past, you're of no effect for the kingdom of God. Focus on Jesus. Keep him front and center. And I will do the rest. And then he said to me, Grace, give me the ashes of your life. Be willing to give your story to me. Give me your story and watch what I do with it. And you see, God, you know, he, he works with me like this because he says to me, what do you do when you've had a bride, Grace? What do you do with the ashes? I said, I tell the children to throw it in the garden. And he says, why? 
And I said, well, because the ashes give back minerals to the ground. And he says, watch what I do with yours. Watch the harvest I will bring from your ashes. Because equally, your story in my hands will provide nutrition to the harvest field behind you. And that is what he wants to do with every single one of us. You see, Revelation 12, 11 says this, and it's my mantra in life. I use this verse often, and I live by it. They overcame him, meaning the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now, we love that part. It's this last part where we start to say, I don't know, God, this is, the, this is the part where it gets real. They did not count their lives dear unto death. In fact, some of them say they did not love their lives, but laid them down. You see, for me, I had to get over the shame of telling my story. I had to not love my life. I had to say, God, no matter what, use whatever in my life. Use the ashes. Use the ashes. Because it's no longer mine. I've given it to you. And trust me, the moment I did that, he was willing. Very willing. I remember one day he says to me, Grace, I want you to share a certain part of your testimony with this woman. Now, it was a sinful part of my, my testimony. And I knew this woman was a gossip. And I was like, God, do you know her? <laughs> like, I know her. And he said, yes, I know her, but I know her better than you. And I shared. I was like, okay, God, you know what? I've got to get used to this of releasing stories that I'm uncomfortable with yeah. so that you may be glorified. And I told her. Nothing happened that day, and I was like praying, oh, God. <laughs> A month later, she came back and told me of something that was so shameful in her own past. And the reason she told me, she said to me, the day you shared with me your shame. I knew I could trust you with mine. God knew that. I didn't. God knew that that would touch her heart in a way I could never, ever touch it. You see, when we give God the ashes of our lives, we've got to be willing to lay our lives down, to say there's nothing hidden from God. And that means that if he says testify and share, we share. So this morning when I was praying about the service, God says to me, okay, Grace, um, I was, no, let me, let me backtrack. I was like, Lord, I don't want it to be about me. I want you to be glorified. Show me. Show me what are some of the things that people need to hear today for them to truly be free in Jesus. And one of the things God says to me is, Grace, talk to them about internal vows. And I knew exactly, you know those, I will never, or I am always. I am always stubborn. Or I am, I will never be like my father. I will never tell anybody. I don't know about anybody else, but for me, that was one of my never statements. My internal vows was when, I, when God was saying, Grace, I, wanna talk, I want you to talk about the sexual abuse that went on. I was like, God, no. It's too painful. I am not going there. I will never go there. You know, I love that God just goes, mm-hmm. We'll see about that. 
I thank the good Lord that he led me to repent of that internal vow and to renounce it and to replace it with the truth of his word. Because today I can stand and I can talk about these things without fear, shame, guilt, all that gunk. It's gone. If you have made internal vows, God, I will never. Don't ever ask me to do that. Today is the day you need to repent of those vows. Renounce them. Revoke them. And replace them with God's truth. Today is the day where you need to come out of being aligned to darkness and be aligned to the truth of God's word and his light. You see, I was aligned to darkness that told me I was a victim of my circumstances. But the truth is, and God, Jesus tells us this, he says that the light drives out the darkness. Now, if you are feeling like you're in a dark space, you are feeling like, oh, Lord, I don't know. Come out of alignment with darkness and be aligned to the light and truth of Jesus Christ today. So, some of these things take time. You know, we've taken years to learn these things. Now we have to unlearn them. So they take processes. Recently, I read this quote. McCovey, sorry, can I ask you to just bring the last one up? Thanks. I read this quote by Stephen Cope. The night sea journey is the journey into the parts of ourselves that are split off, disavowed, unknown, unwanted, cast out, and exiled to the various subterranean worlds of consciousness. The goal of this journey, meaning the, the, the goal of the healing journey, is to re reunite us with ourselves. Such a homecoming can be surprisingly painful, even brutal. In order to undertake it, we must first agree to exile nothing. There needs to come a part, time in your life, where you say, no, from here, no further. You've got to draw a line in the sand. You have got to make a decision to come out of alignment with darkness and step into the glorious light of Jesus Christ and allow his truth to minister to you. No healing journey is easy or comfortable, but it is always good when we do it with Jesus. Because... He is the Son who sets us free, and we will be free indeed. So I have some resource, resources here. The movies are for those that don't like to read. <laughs> they speak to identity and worth. You know, I remember when I watched Overcomer the first time, and there's a particular scene in which the main character comes in and, and says, I know who I am. I know who I am. No, in fact, she says to her coach, ask me who I am. And he looks at her like, mm hmm? And she's like, no, ask me. Ask me who, who, who I am. And then she starts to say everything from Ephesians 1. I am forgiven. I am free. 
I am a child of God. Today, you have a choice. The Search for Significance is a book that I really like. I use it quite often with people with, that come and count, that I counsel. And the reason I like it is because it takes the lies that we often believe and it gives you the scriptures to be able to replace it with. It doesn't just tell you how. It doesn't just say, oh, you know, this and then that. You literally do a Bible study to undo what the world has said. The blue one is for teens and students. Beautiful Lies is Jennifer Strickland's personal story of being a supermodel and all the lies that go with that world and how the truth of God's word transformed her life. I leave you with this question. Do you want to be healed? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that it is in Jesus Christ that we are free and we are free indeed. Lord, I pray for people that are bound in darkness in whatever form in their lives, Lord Jesus. I ask that, Lord, today they be set free, that they make that decision, Lord, to come to you and say, I need for Jesus to set me free. I pray, Lord Jesus, that today identities be established in what you have said about them. It's not just, Lord, that we wait for a prophetic word, but that we start to believe your word and what you say about us. Give us that ability today in Jesus' name. Lord, Help us to give you the ashes of our lives and watch how you transform them into crowns of authority. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.